Materials supplied by Microsoft Corporation may be used for internal review, analysis, or research only. Any editing, reproduction, publication, rebroadcast, public showing, internet or public display is forbidden and may violate copyright law. And uh, I'm uh, very pleased to welcome you to another beautiful day in Beijing. Uh, we're very privileged today to have Alex Saleh as our keynote speaker, talking about From Genes to Stars and Jim Gray's Fourth Paradigm. Let me just read you a few words from his bio. He's the Alumni Centennial Professor of Astronomy at Johns Hopkins University and also a professor in computer science. He's director of the Institute for Data Intensive Science. He's a cosmologist who works on statistical measures of the spatial distribution of galaxies and galaxy formation. Uh, a corresponding member of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And in 2004, he received an Alexander von Humboldt Award in Physical Sciences. And in 2007, he received the Jim Gray Award. In 2008, he became Dr. Honoris Causa of the Jotvos University in Budapest. Uh, he enjoys playing with big data, it says here. Well, he was one of the ones who started the, the big data revolution in astronomy with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and did some pioneering work with Jim Gray using databases in astronomy with the Sky Server project. So Alex uh, is an astronomer, but his interests range from computational fluid dynamics to genes to astronomy and almost everything. So let's give Alex a round of applause and look forward to his keynote. Alex. Thank you very much, Tony. And it's very, very nice to be back here in China. So I would like to talk today about the journey that we have undertaken with Jim over the last, uh, almost last 20 years. And so the title of the talk is From Genes to Stars, trying to kind of give uh, probably some credit to all the different areas of science we have tried to touch. And so what we are faced today is that we have big data in science, and the data is growing exponentially. It's doubling every year. And as a result, all science is becoming increasingly data-driven. And furthermore, this is happening very rapidly. One particular additional challenge is that we are under we live in an age when it is expected from us to actually publish the data, to make the data open and public. And of course, we, the people who practice this know all very well that this doesn't necessarily mean the data is accessible. So the fact that we actually make the data onto a public website, it doesn't mean that people can use it. It's quite, quite a lot of work to pass this particular hurdle. And we, over the years, we have come to understand that a lot of the steps in this process are non-incremental. So as the data is doubling every year, we just can't afford to buy every year twice as much computing. We need to change the way we approach these problems. We see another interesting thing happening. For a long time, science has become increasingly reductionist. So, so we started out with natural philosophy, which spun off physics, chemistry, biology, and so on. And then later on, various subdivisions, you know, theoretical chemistry, experimental physics. But what we see today is that through computing and big data, we see another convergence between life and physical sciences. So people who do systems biology are using very similar simulation techniques to those of in the physical sciences. The other thing is that when we talk about big data, we shouldn't forget that it is not just about the terabytes and petabytes of data sitting in really big data sets, in small number of big data sets, but there is also a huge number of small data sets lying around. Indeed, much of the scientific data is actually in these small files. And we have to deal with that challenge as well. 
But so we should realize that today there is a genuine scientific revolution taking place, which hasn't happened all that much in the history of science. So we live in a very special, at a very special time. So there is hardly a week goes by that in the New York Times, or in the Washington Post, or in the Times, there is not an article about big data, especially in the context of genomics, which is really expanding. So we heard several talks about this. And this is a slide that we built together with Jim, which shows how science is changing. So how a thousand years ago science was entirely empirical. And you know, the, this was one of the earliest studies in turbulence, when Leonardo drew the turbulent flow and put it in one of his codices. And then subsequently, starting with Kepler, we tried to capture nature in simple analytic equations, which also had a simple analytic solution. So that was the abstraction derived from the empirical data. And so we developed the theoretical branch of science. Starting with Fermi and Ulam during the Manhattan Project, we used, started to use computers to solve some of these equations, which may have been very simple in form, like the Navier-Stokes equation, but their solution can be very arbitrarily complex. And what we see today is data-intensive science, or e-science, or data-driven discoveries, which is really a synthesis of many of these. Synthesizes theory, experiment, and computation with statistics. And all in all, this requires a new way of thinking about the scientific process. So how does the scientific data analysis scene look like today? So first of all, the data is everywhere. It's not never, and it never will be in a single location. The exponential doubling comes from the fact that every year we build much cheaper sensors with much higher capacity. Think about the digital cameras and the CCD chips in our cameras. I have already gone through several generations of digital cameras over the last few years. And I think this is at the heart of the sequencers, the high throughput sequencers at the, high throughput, at, at the new telescopes. And basically, this is all driven by Moore's law, the same silicon technology, which enables us to every couple of years to build devices which have twice the number of transistors. But what happens, think about a little bit, how do we do our analysis? If our data is doubling every year, and say roughly Moore's law says that uh, the computers are doubling every year for simplicity. So basically, as the data is coming in, we can do the pipeline processing. We can keep up with the data. But if we want to do a statistical analysis, which is an N squared algorithm, like a cluster, clustering of data, then suddenly, if we have an N squared algorithm, the task when the data is doubling and our computers double in size, a quadratic algorithm will take four times as long. A cubic algorithm will take eight times as long. So sooner or later, we will live in a world where with the big data, the only algorithms that survive are N log N. Anything that scales worse than that, we will just not be able to execute. So we will need to rethink how we do our statistics. Because a minimum variance estimator, if we have N data points, requires the inversion of an N squared matrix, which is N cubed operation. So basically, forget it. So we have to come up with algorithms which are incremental. And first of all, their heart is in the idea that the computational cost is a very substantial part of the cost function. So we have to be able to compute for a minute, for an hour, and we should improve our statistical accuracy if we compute it for an hour and if we compute it for a day. But it will be our decision when to stop. And that should be part of the cost. So the statistics has to be computable in finite time. That's the essence. At the same time, the computer architectures that we have today are increasingly CPU heavy and IO poor. The distance between the disks and the CPUs is growing. So we need to rethink what the computer architectures can we use, basically, for such computations. And again, I have to go back to Jim, 
who in the mid-90s wrote a paper about cyber bricks where he postulated that there will come a time when the disk controllers, the chips in the disk controllers will be fast enough that they can do the processing of the data on the disks. He called it cyber bricks. And we are getting very close. The latest solid state disks have ARM chips on them. And also, basically, in a lot of the tablets, we have quad core ARM soon, where we'll have eight core ARM chips in there. So one can very easily imagine that just one of those chips is the disk controller, the rest of them does the processing. So the word of the cyber bricks has come. When we look at how is the data analysis done, Still today, most of the scientific data analysis is done on small to mid-sized bare wolf clusters, which are typically have pretty poor I.O. They don't have very much disk space, so they are completely inadequate for the job. But that's what we have. And they are put in broom closets. And soon, the different departments uh, melting down the buildings, basically, through power. Because the faculty is trying to buy more and more of these computers, which are inadequately cooled, inadequately maintained. So basically, this is not scalable and not maintainable. People have to do something else. So Jim, throughout the years as we worked together on the Sloan data, we realized that there is a lot of these things are coming. So his first law was, or first rule of thumb, was that scientific computing is increasingly revolving around data. Today it seems pretty trivial, but at that time it was all about supercomputing. So scientific computing was about craze. And <clears throat> The other next postulate is that we need a scale-out solution for the analysis. And again, th at that point there were, so this is what we see today. So Google and Facebook and, and Microsoft, they are all building relatively very large numbers of very cheap servers to do the data analysis in the cloud. The next thing was the realization that the network speeds are falling behind the growth of the data, so we will not be able to move the data fast enough, just in time for the analytics. And this was at the time when the computational grid was very fashionable. And the grid was very good for certain things where you had a small number of parameters. You took basically those parameters to where the compute was. You ran the jobs, and you got back also a few numbers as the result. And you cleaned up after yourself. This worked very well in this world. But it doesn't work if you have to move terabytes to where your compute is and then move terabytes back. So, so Jim's postulate was that we have to take the analysis to the data. This is what we see now every day in cloud computing. He had a very good heuristic way to communicate with domain scientists. He said, that don't write a requirements document. Just tell me what are the questions that you want to ask. And this was the first thing when he asked me when we first met. And then I said, OK, so I want to ask anything and everything from my data. And Jim laughed. And he said, OK, why don't you just give me the 20 questions that you want to ask? And the first five was really easy. And I could do it in a few minutes. Next five, I had to scratch my head, and after that, I had to go home. And, and this taught me humility that, okay, not every question is equally important, and there are some questions that are trivial, and I want to ask every, multiple times every day from the data, and so will everybody else. So those really have to run very fast. And this was much better than a brain dump of a requirements document which had a kitchen sink in it, because it forced me as the scientist to prioritize. And this worked extremely well ever since. And his last postulate was go from working to working. Because in this world, there is one thing constant in the world of computing, that everything is changing every two years, the comp especially the distributed computing paradigm. So we have to build such applications which are able to grow and evolve. And if, so when I started in distributed computing on the Sloan, it was still a word of CORBA. Then it was computational grid. Then it was web services, grid services. Today it is the cloud. We can, take, we can be sure that in two years there will be something else coming up. So a lot of essays have been by, written by Jim's friend and put in this book, which is downloadable from Microsoft. I really urge you to download it and, and live through it. So what are these 
non-incremental changes. First of all, we don't just need to change the computational architecture, we need to change the statistics, we need to change the way we do the data acquisition, we have to change the way we do the data analysis. And so this means that the people who do this have to understand not just statistics, not just computer science, not just astronomy or genomics, but kind of all of the above. So this is the, and, and it is again not just doing 20% more, we have to do a factor of two more every year. So we have to change the ways we approach things. And the other apparent thing is that science is moving increasingly from quote unquote hypothesis driven to data driven discoveries. And of course people, I always get into arguments when I say this, because in a sense, so I was wondering why were astronomers so easy to convince that this is an interesting way to, to adopt. And I realized in the process that astronomers have, been always been, have always been data driven. Since we cannot run experiments in the ordinary sense, on the, on, like on the desktop, so I go in and change the mixture of the chemicals or, or tweak a dial, all that we can do is observe the sky. And we can do, of course, two kinds of data-driven discoveries. The first is exploratory, and then we derive hypothesis from the exploratory data, and then we do confirmatory uh, analysis. And with the confirmatory, we actually then get, we, we do have hypothesis going in, but generally, when we, did, when we discovered supernovae, we didn't have a hypothesis that this is the end of stellar collapse or the stellar evolution, we just saw something go ping on the sky. And the first supernova appeared, I believe, on the Chinese star charts. So how did I get into this? So I was a cosmologist working happily on doing correlation functions and power spectra of the galaxy distribution. And in 1992, Hopkins joined the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. It was roughly at the same time when the Human Genome Project started. It's not an accident. So basically, the technology of the large CCD mosaics has become mature enough that you could also basically do the processing of the genomes. And we could also build big enough mosaics to cover the sky. It's a it was a collaboration of a bunch of private universities, NSF, NASA, the Sloan Foundation, and so on. And we set out to map the sky, what was visible from North America. We built a special telescope. And we, took two and a, we planned to do two and a half trillion pixels of images. We thought we would collect about 10 terabytes of raw data and build a database with half a terabyte. And we, we also thought we would finish by 2000, by building everything and running the observations. Well, we didn't even start. So everything was delayed, everything was a bit hard there. But as a, in the end, it took us 18 years, actually 16 years to finish. Um, but more slow came to the rescue, Crider slow came to the rescue, so everything became cheaper, so we could be much more ambitious with the data. Aspects. So we doubled the sky coverage. In the end, we have now 400 terabytes of data that we have to archive. And the database is close to 35 terabytes. And the database is run out of, out of Hopkins. And so with Jim, we started, we actually built the sky server, the prototype of the sky server essentially in two or three months in 2001. We didn't get much sleep, really. And after that, a whole bunch of people came in and helped, and so it's, uh, there is now a lot more code in it, and uh, the, you know, the sweat and blood of a whole group of people. But in 12 years, in hindsight, we, have, we exceeded now a billion web hits. We run 200 million SQL queries, which were actually not connected to the web services, but these were coming in from the outside. We have 4 million distinct IP addresses of users versus about 15,000 professional astronomers in the world. So this is really remarkable, how, we, how broad an audience we managed to attract. And what we saw is the emergence of the internet scientist, the person who is not a professional, but is actually interested in doing original research if there is an interesting enough data. And as a result, this became the world's most used astronomy facility today. And so this just shows some traffic graphs, and we are still growing. 
So the traffic is still increasing. One is the altogether the web hits and the other one is the SQL queries. SQL queries are now flattened off. The big spikes are basically the new data releases. We have one data release every year and we don't throw away the old releases. We hold on to them like we don't burn the old editions of a book. We just put next to it a new edition of the book on the bookshelf. And, but, but such a way, having a yearly edition of the data release makes it very clear for a paper to code that which version of the data is being used. Okay, one unique feature that we built about two years after the data release is the MyDB, which, uh, where we gave our power users, the people who started to run really complicated queries and workflows, uh, they own server-side database. So instead of piping the query output through the internet to the home computer, we allowed them to write it into their own database right next to the main data server where they were in full control. And we have now about 7,000 people using it, so roughly half of the world's astronomy community is using this feature. And over the years, it developed into a full collaborative environment. People even published data sets associated with a paper and made it word visible, not just group visible, but word visible. And so this is actually delivering, so sending analysis directly to the data, fairly complex analysis workflows. This shows, by the way, how based upon citations, we were the number one for several years in a row, we have been the number one astronomy facility of the world. And the goals were to provide easy access to exciting new data. And we went and visited David Lippmann with Jim when we were in the process of designing this. And David gave us a very interesting paper, which said that if you design a form-based interface to the databases, you have to provide a backdoor for the scientist. Because if the, if the forms designer was a mediocre programmer, then only, you can only do those search patterns that the programmer allowed you to do. You have to provide basically a free form access so that the, nothing limits the creativity or, and the imagination of the scientists. In any case, with the fact that the power user got the own DB, this was really the first example of cloud computing in 2000, working in 2003. So in 2007, there was a group in Oxford, a group of students in Oxford who had the idea that why don't we post a bunch of images on the web from the Sloan survey and ask the public to visually classify it. And it helped to have Brian May helping from the Queen. He was the guitarist of Queen who got his PhD that year. And he loaned us his web designer and who designed a beautiful site and then also helped us to publicize it. And it hit the BBC Nightly News and the next day we had 300,000 people classifying galaxies. And what was remarkable, not just the hype about this, so that was nice, but there were some genuinely important original discoveries made on this data by amateurs. So this little green thing on the side was classified by the telescope software as reflective light and you can see there is a lot more structure to it so and the Dutch school teacher uh, Honey van Arken has written a blog about this that she thinks that this may be more interesting and it turns out that it was an entirely unique object which has since been observed by the Hubble Space Telescope several NASA satellites the big radio telescope array in New Mexico so and she was a first year author on all those papers so we built the Sky Server and the MyDB, the, the server-side analysis environment for the users. And over the years, this spun off into a whole slew of different projects, from radiation oncology to environmental science to the Galaxy Zoo to numerical simulations to the Hubble Space Telescope. Whole archival system is now being converted to this. A lot of the virtual observatory tools, the Palomar Telescopes Observatory. And of course, this all was actually a spin-off of the Terra server that Jim built as a torture test for SQL server, which was just acquired by Microsoft at the time from Sybase. And so it turned out when we started to work together, so Tom Barkley gave us a lot of his code. We actually recycled some of the Terra server code. We turned the telescope from inside looking down on the Earth out 
to space, but we used a lot of the similar geospatial ideas and basically generalized it, and now we generalize it even further. So this is an example of the Onco space where they basically took the sky survey framework but applied it and converted it to do radiation oncology through an active database where basically they follow the treatment of a patient and compare it to all the other patients in the database who had similar symptoms and got a similar treatment, how well the patient is following the treatment plan. This is now, Toshiba is now financing it to, into a startup. So, Life Under Your Feet was another project where Jim and I basically wrote a whole bunch of time series scripts in a matter of two or three weeks and we put out a bunch of sensors to study the carbon cycle measured from the soil. And we put out a bunch of little wireless sensors and this shows that the kind of we started in the middle of 2006 and you can see the number of sensors, this, these are the number of sensor samples collected. We are, today we are roughly around 200 million samples. And our samples include Brazil, the Atacama Desert in Chile, then a whole bunch of places in the US. And we are now doing a deployment in South Africa, Finland, Hungary, and, and again the US. In the second half of the talk, I would like to talk about a new kind of instrument the, which generates even larger amounts of data, and these are the supercomputers, HPC instruments. And so what we see today is that the largest simulations are approaching petabytes, and this happens from you know, supernovae to turbulence and also to brain modeling. And generally, a lot of the analysis is happening on the fly. As the simulation is running, you analyze the data and then you throw it away. And this is not good enough. So there is more and more pressure from the public who want to compare, for example, experiments to supercomputer simulations. They want to access the best and latest and the biggest simulations. And this creates a whole bunch of new challenges in how to move the data, how to look at it, how to interface, how to analyze, and what architectures do we want to use. So this is an example when we had to move 150 terabytes from Oak Ridge in 10 days because we got a phone call that unless we move it, it will be deleted. And it it was much easier said than done. This was a few years back. Uh, today it's much easier. So we were able, I think a couple of weeks ago, to move 50 terabytes from, from Texas in a matter of, I think, one afternoon. So how do we visualize a petabyte? Today, generally, we do the visual analytics in taking the data and copying it to a workstation with a big enough GPU uh, on it and then basically do the rendering there. Very few people have access to the caves. But with petabytes, we can't do this. So again, we are back to take the analysis where the data is, take the visualization where the data is, because almost everybody has now a mobile device in their pockets which can receive a high definition video stream. So basically we can stream the results and this is limited only pretty much by our perception. So everybody in the world can actually get a video stream that is as much as our brain can capture. So we have to do the rendering where the data is. And I will show a few examples. So what are the usage scenarios for this big data from simulations? There is a life cycle which we have to understand. So today most of the things are done on this using the on-the-fly analysis or a private reuse where they put some of the snapshots onto a scratch disk and analyze it. Okay, but there is an increasing pressure for public reuse. The only way for the public reuse, or almost the only way, is to make some of the files available. It's okay with a few terabytes. It's not okay with 100 terabytes, and it's undoable over a petabyte. And at the same time, there is, if we want to keep things, it would be, make sense to build smart services on top of the data, which actually deliver intelligent data products. But this, invert, this requires a bunch of investment in time and programming. So it only makes sense if we want to keep the data for a medium to long term. And then we have to think about, for the most important reference data sets, about the long term archival and curation. So I'd like to show two use cases. Here, one is from turbulence and the other one is for, from cosmology. 
Turbulence is interesting because it's entirely classical physics. Feynman said it's the last unsolved problem of classical physics. And about eight years back, with Charles Menevo, we started a project to take snapshots of a large 1,000 cube simulations, simulation and we stored 1,000 time steps in a database and we built a very fine-grained spatial index over it. And we came up with a new metaphor, how to analyze it. This was around the time when the movie Twister was popular. So imagine that you have a turbulence, the tornado in a box, and instead of driving up to the tornado with a car and shoot an accelerometer in it, you take your laptop and shoot sensors into the tornado in the, in the database. And then the sensors report back the fluid velocity wherever they are. So that's a metaphor. And it works like a charm. You can do, depending on where you place the particles, you can do all sorts of analysis patterns. And so, for example, you can run time backwards. You cannot do it with a dissipative simulation because there the error of time is not reversible. But we can put down particles in a loop and then move them backwards using the interpolation and integration. So this is the daily usage of our system from all over the world. On a typical day, we deliver about 100 billion points. And over in 2011, we exceeded 100 billion points, points delivered to the world. And uh, so this is a recent paper that, was appear that appeared this summer in Nature, where Greg Eying from Hopkins solved a long-standing problem in magnetohydronic tur turbulence. What it took is to put down a whole bunch of particles, several million particles in small volumes, and then integrate their trajectories backward, adding a stochastic random perturbation term. And then once he computed the orbits, then he, he integrated the magnetic, the evolution of the magnetic field forward along the trajectories and was able to show that they satisfy a certain scaling law that was predicted in 1923 by Richardson. But nobody was able to prove it ever since. So this led to basically a really major publication in, a, in one of the most respected <laughs> academic journals. How can we do visualization with large amounts of data? This was an experiment also with the turbulence database. So we basically popped a GPU card into the database server for maximizing the bandwidth. And we stream the data from the database directly into the visualization engine and did the following visualization on the fly. So let me see if I can trigger this. Yeah. OK. So basically, the whole point of this is that this, you could see the same movie in real time over, a multi, over tens of terabytes of simulations. So, so this is embedded visualization with, integrated with a relational database. And very high speed, so the data was streaming at several gigabytes per second. Okay. And today, the turbulence is after the Nature paper, it, it's, the word has exploded. So we had basically two databases in use, the 30 and 50 terabyte. We are loading now from University of Texas a 100 terabyte database, which is a channel flow. Then we are getting from Argon a 500 terabyte database of, of another magnetohydrodynamic turbulence simulation, but with much higher resolution. Then somebody at Los Alamos is running a 20 terabyte rotating fluid. Somebody else is doing a two fluid mixture that simulates internal combustion engines. And then Los Alamos, somebody is planning to run a 6,000 6, cubed box with about 1,000 time steps. So that would be a world record in simulations. And the plan is to bring it to Hopkins and turn it into a database. So in cosmology, it also started around the same time. So in Munich, I was on sabbatical in Munich and worked with uh, Herard Lemson there. And we took a large simulation that was 30 terabytes of data. But it turned out it was on a tape robot in the Rechenzentrum, and nobody was able to touch it. And so we took the top one terabyte, which was just the galaxies and not the dark matter particles, and put it into the Sloan framework and made it public and put it also a MyDB database next to it so people could stream the results. Anyway, so over 
over this time, we have now 600 registered users in this database, millions of queries. And there was a workshop with last December in Garching with 50 top users of the system came and gave talks about what science did they do with it and also what features would they like to see. And it was really remarkable. So they want to push the data sizes. So people are now starting to run petabyte size simulations in cosmology with trillion particles of dark matter. And they want to store hundreds of time steps of this and want to look at the dark matter trajectories. So there are a bunch of good questions. How is the data stored? How does it get there? There are all sorts of different computations that they want to do on the data a posteriori. Some of them are very localized based on individual galaxies. They just want to create fake galaxies in the simulation by changing the recipe of star formation. So right now there is, this is pre-computed and everybody can compare but there is only one galaxy formation scenario and people would like to be able to play basically in a 70 dimensional space, parameter space. Then there are all sorts of rendering issues. So how could people create fake observations? What would the space telescope see if it observed this simulation? And of course, the problem is that cosmological distances, the light travel time is important. So as I go back on a light cone, I have to look at earlier time steps of the simulation. I have to look back in time. But so this means we have to store actually enough snapshots so that I can interpolate in time well enough. And then there are all sorts of global analytics where I have to take the whole simulation volume and basically do a Fourier transform on the density grid. And there are all sorts of issues with data representations. We are doing another thing at Hopkins where we are taking not the biggest and latest simulation, but we try to take a medium-sized simulation, but we are running 500 realizations of it so that we have an engine where we can compute statistical ensemble averages and covariances. And actually much of the computations are done by Ji Wang, who is here at the National Observatory Beijing. And we are, currently at we are currently at 100 simulations and exceeding 200 terabytes. So this is all loaded into the database. Another thing is the Milky Way Laboratory, which is a project run at Oak Ridge, or it was run, the first half was run at Oak Ridge, and the second half will be run probably in uh, Switzerland. But here the idea is that we will be able to shoot test particles at twelve test galaxies a posteriori into the simulation and see how they get disrupted in the time variable gravitational field. So people can kind of play, uh, almost play God in this simulation. Okay. So how do we... So what we have seen in the simulations in the database that in seven years that we have been doing this, there is an incredible progress. And so the community, especially in cosmology, they are playing the database as if it was a musical instrument. So they are not just kind of making, it's not just using it as a tool, but they are using it in an artful fashion. And they are using it for things we never imagined they would do with it. And we have all these new challenges, but it's not about storage. So we are way past the stage when, this, when the people are happy just to run a SQL query on this. But it is clear that we can't use a supercomputer to do the posterior analysis either. We need something in between, which is halfway between a database server and halfway between a supercomputer. And so we are trying to write a middleware at Hopkins called MPIDB, which would basically use MPI calls to pipe data in and out into a large distributed parallel database. But so what are the architectural challenges? How can we build a system that's good for such a task? Well, certainly not at the supercomputers, okay, because supercomputers have this space which is very, very fast usually, but it's also very expensive. If we want to store petabytes and we want to keep them there for years, that we have to do it cheaper. So computations and visualization must be on top of the data. So it's not a database server either because we have to have more CPU cycles and more GPU renderings available than what you normally have in a database server. And so all in all, what is utmost importance, we need a very high bandwidth to the source of the data. Generally, we have been using databases very well, but there are all these myths about databases that all oh, databases are not scalable. Okay, 
And people said that this is why people Google build MapReduce. Well, the answer is wrong. Google has now been building actually proper SQL databases on top of the big table framework. So they have several Dremel tensing spanner. These are all SQL compliant databases. Some of them are global. But what we also learned, that databases are very good if we have, fine, if we have to have fine granularity data access. But we also need a lot of extremely sophisticated value-added services on top of the data. So in SkyServer, we have 700 user-defined functions, which capture an, lots of astronomy knowledge. But basically, flat files are very good if we read the data in bulk. But when we need fine granularity access, then nothing beats the database and the indices. And it makes no sense to build master servers. So ginormous databases, we need to scale out, basically find kind of cheap components like the cloud, but which has this integrated integration of cheap storage and also sufficient amount of high performance computing right on top. And probably we need to shove in for some of the problems uh, so, sort of a, some number of large memory in memory systems. So we built a bunch of extensions to SQL Server. One is large arrays. So Mike Stonebreaker is building SciDB, which is a relational database where the primitive data type is a multidimensional array. We rather took this existing SQL Server and we added the large arrays to it. And Jose, with Jose Blakely and Dragan Tomic from the SQL Server group, um, and it has a whole bunch of MATLAB features. So we can take a binary array and we can slice and dice it, aggregate it, and subset it uh, into SQL. But there is a new addition in the new version of SQL Server called File Table, because it has been a pain to load data into databases, especially this large binary data, because everything is stored in eight kilobyte pages. So you take a large data set, you shard it into eight kilobyte pages, you put a header on every one of the pages, and then you build a B3 of those. And then when you want to read the data, you have to reverse. And in SQL Server 12, there's a new feature called File Table, where you just copy files into a directory, and they automatically appear in the database. But you can then also access those files from the database database side, and you can build an index onto the file contents in the database side, and using the so-called SQL bytes interface in C Sharp, in the CLR, you can actually seek into the different offsets inside these files. So we can, essentially, we can write our own native binary file format, but still use it with the database. It's fantastic. And so, so this is what we are working right now. So here, the files, the, we could potentially read the direct with the simulation outputs as they come up the supercomputers, and it's loaded. The other trick is how do we use GPUs? And this is just one example. So we had a simulation with 400 million particles, the Via Lactea simulation. And one of the challenges is to compute the dark matter annihilation. That we, do, we know that there is dark matter, we don't know what it is. But there is a satellite up there which is looking at the gamma ray sky, and it sees a little bit of access towards the galactic center, which people hope that it may be the first elusive sign of directly seeing dark matter. So this is very hot. So we took the simulation and computed the dark matter annihilation map. And that spot there is the galactic center in the simulation. This is like a Milky Way galaxy box. Originally, it was. The guy who ran the simulation, Mike Coolen, who is a faculty, who is in Berkeley, it took him eight hours on a CPU to run a single annihilation map. And then we, one of my students has rewritten it in OpenGL in Windows. And we can run it now in 24 seconds. So this is fine. This is a thousand time increase. We did because we realized that this is really a rendering problem. But what the 24 seconds enables us now to play with the particle physics. We can change the cross section, the physical cross section of the dark matter, and we run 20 different scenarios. And for every one of those, we pre compute, the, we can recompute basically the annihilation map shown on the next image. And it is the same patch of the sky. And, and the four correspond to different types of annihilation, whether we have the so called Sommerfeld correction in it. Anyway, 
so we can at this point exclude quite a lot of the physical processes that are around for the dark matter simply from these computations because they already conflict the existing satellite measurements. So we are submitting a FISREV letters paper about this. So this is a fact when doing something in 20 seconds instead of eight hours makes all the difference in how you do your science. So what are the disk needs today? The disk is data intensive scientific computing. And you know, in real estate, people ask, okay, what are the three most important things when buying real estate? Location, location, location. And it turns out that in scientific computing, our biggest problem today in the data intensive computing is this space, this space, this space. And, and then afterwards, the next thing is how do we move the data? And kind of 100 terabytes is the magic limit still today, which is below it is relatively simple, above it is becoming very, very hard. And so I, we built a system at Hopkins called the Datascope. This is the newer version of the Gray Wolf that we built originally with Microsoft's help. The, here the idea is to build a system with multiple petabytes, which also has extreme I.O. bandwidths, but also enough GPU computing integrated. And we got the GPUs from NVIDIA and much of the CPUs from Intel, so we could build it actually below a billion dollars. Uh, so the disk, cap disk capacity is six and a half petabytes, but we can hit about half a terabyte sustained read in parallel, of course. And we have altogether 90 GPUs. And so every machine, on the average, every machine has a GPU in it. The last bit I would like to talk about is the long tail and how it impacts science. There are two interesting lessons to learn. There is Facebook and Dropbox. What is the Facebook lesson? So Facebook brought together a bunch of totally, in a sense, uninteresting and irrelevant data sets and data. And, and as this data ap approached a critical size, then suddenly new context started to emerge. And so new associations emerged. And so what is the science equivalent? Could we build something like this? And the other lesson is Dropbox, where basically doing something which is ultra simple, you just drag and drop and then something happens, but you don't have to read a 50-page manual to use it. That's also sometimes simple interfaces are much more powerful than a complex one, and they are also much harder to build. And so we, we are trying to merge some of these ideas in something we call the side drive. Um, so the idea is that we build basically a server-side storage environment. There's nothing fancy about this. Like, it's like Dropbox. And we actually emulated the Dropbox interface. But the idea is that once people upload data into it, we reserve the right to automatically harvest the metadata. Because all attempts so far where we ask scientists to publish their data and fill out the associated metadata forms have been an utter failure. So basically, scientists are just not patient enough. They don't have the patience to actually be bothered with filling out those forms. And so we have to do something better. We offer them some, something for, for essentially nothing. We offer them free storage. And we will have to make do with what we can harvest from the data. So OK, so what's the idea? First of all, so we give cloud, stor cloud storage for small data in different science communities. We enable them to link all these data sets to each other and also to analysis services. Again, there is nothing fancy so far. But if you, for example, upload something and we could harvest the header or if we can figure out some metadata, it goes into a, automatically into a relational database in the user space. So the users can start searching on, for example, all sorts of key value pairs related to this. If it's a tabular data, the data is automatically loaded again into a user-owned relational database. This is similar to SQL Share that Bill Howe built at uh, uh, University of Washington. 
But his experience has shown that even without the metadata, when people from a given project were just able to basically upload a whole bunch of small spreadsheets, which were very hard to federate and fuse, in a database this was much easier to write joint queries, which actually brought all these data sets together. But furthermore, we know a lot more about the people. So the people will have to have a user account. From the user account, we can actually link them to a general user ID. So we can find out what the publications are. And for example, uh, Alex Wade at Microsoft has been collecting the texts of the corpus of the scientific papers over a wider set of disciplines. So we actually know the social network of the authors. We know the texts of the papers. So if you see the column headers in the, in the tables, we can actually look up the papers, what is the broader context and what is the meaning. So we actually have much richer information than, we, than you would normally think that we have. Anyway, so, so we have now a 400 terabyte system online already at Hopkins, and this is linked both to uh, the MyDB in Sloan and also to the Azure service that Bill Howe built. So we can actually point the relational tables to it, into either of those two systems. Starts to genes, let's reverse this. So what did astronomy teach us about genomics and genes? And there is a huge parallelism between genomics today and what astronomy was 20 years ago before the Sloan. So before the Sloan, astronomers typically looked at a small patch of the sky, they took their own images, took them home, then spent six months to basically do the basic image processing. Everybody had a different image processing tool, and even if they shared the same tool, they used different parameters, and no two astronomers would agree basically what is the right way of doing things. And most of the time was spent on this, on this footwork down in the trenches. Once Sloan was published, we did a basically a shrink-wrapped, calibrated data release. Astronomers first didn't believe that this is good enough, and they tried to repeat and, and to the pro, in the processing. And after a while, they realized that this is good enough, and they, it was not worth the effort trying to repeat what we have already done over the sky. And they rather started to run database queries over the whole sky. So what is the state in genomics? Much of it is based on files and Perl scripts, and the information, the metadata, is typically stored in the file headers in the long file names. Everybody is observed running their own aligners, and no two people agree on what, exactly what parameters do they use on Bowtie or BWA. Does this sound familiar? And they don't use databases. And, but at the same time, this works when you have one to 10 genomes, but it will break down when we have a thousand genomes or when we have a million genomes. So we will have to have databases to actually organize all these. So basically for statistical processing and collaboration, you need a database behind and also find a common processing that is good enough to do the very basic things and spend your time on the discovery and on the interesting statistical analysis. So some of the things that we have done here is if we wanted to get into very massive processing, it turns out also that the current aligners are not quite fast enough, so we wrote our own. So uh, Richard Wilton in the physics department, who is both a computer scientist, a database <coughs> programmer, and a medical doctor, he worked with Ben Langmead, who is the author of Bowtie 2, which is one of the most popular aligners today, to write a, a GPU aligner, which is pretty much faster than anything else, but also has the same quality as BWA and Bowtie. And so we can actually process a thousand genomes in a measure in a reasonable time. Now we also built an ultra-fast prototype DB based on SQL Server and solid-state disks. How can, how can we search for short reads in the 1,000 one genomes data? And finding both the aligned and unaligned, and one of the things we would like to do is to integrate this with the MyDB so that, again, the results of the queries go Im immediately again into a user database that can then be used to join and cross-correlate with all the patient data and the phenotypes. And the next, we would like to do a side, a side drive uh, custom 
version for genomics where people just drag and drop some of the genomics data in it and it will automatically get processed in the background. So what we see is that there's a big change in sociology. So this, I mentioned already the convergence of physical and life sciences. What we also see is that there is a data collection in ever larger collaborations. We see the virtual observatories on every scale of the physical world from CERN to the virtual astronomical observatory or IBOA, NCBI, and NEON, the ocean observatories. And what we see is that the analysis is becoming decoupled. So an individual co can in principle go in into these data collections and then write a paper from the statistical analysis. And so what we see is also the emergence of the citizen and internet scientist. And this means we need to start training the next generation to be able to thrive in this world. And traditional scientists are I-shaped. So they, we train people today who are very deep and narrow in their own field. And people who we call today interdisciplinary scientists are T-shaped. So they are st still have the depths, but they have sort of a broad but relatively shallow uh, layer on top. But we need to have people who are pie-shaped, who are then at home in the computational statistics. So basically understand computer science statistics, but they also have to be at home in their own science. Otherwise, they will have communication problems. So we need to have this early involvement in computational thinking. So summarizing, science is increasingly driven by data, both large and small, but the integral is large. We see a changing sociology, surveys analyzed by individuals. We are moving from hypothesis-driven to data-driven science. We need to build new instruments. Inst I, this, this is, I think it's more than computing. What we are building is the equivalent of the microscope and telescope for data, really. There is a challenge on the long tail. Data changes not only science but society. We see a new force paradigm of science in emerging. And it's incredible to see that how the Sloan Digital Sky Survey has been at the cusp of the transition. And you know, I would like to finish with a quote from Henry Ford. So he said this, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. If you ask scientists today what would they like, they would say more data and faster computers. But we know that there has to be more. And, and I think this is about e-science, that e-science is more about just faster horses. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alex. Uh, we have, I think, time for a, a few questions. So happy to take some questions from the audience. Yes, there's a couple of questions just back there. So the mic is just coming. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, for uh, data intensive science research, do you feel uh, cloud computing and grid computing, which one is better? And uh, can they uh, solve or partly solve the challenges facing data intensive scientific research? Thank you. Uh, in my mind, it's clearly cloud computing is better. It, the only the business model today is not quite right for science, so the storage is too expensive. The compute cycles in the cloud are very cheap, and they are cheaper than anyone can do, but essentially in all the major cloud computing platforms, you have to pay, f when you pay for storage, you have to buy your storage every month. It's just too much. So if somebody arbitrarily dropped, the, one, one of the providers arbitrarily dropped the price by a factor of 10, then I think suddenly people would swarm. Because there you can do the computing on top of the data, obviously. So, Another question. I have a comment and a question. Uh, first, you say that science has gone from data-driven to sort of more theoretical-driven. I disagree with that dichotomy. I think that science basically tries to search insights, and there are, there are different points of friction according to what the knowledge that you have and what you can do. That is, when you have a problem that you have enough, not enough theory, you spend your time developing mathematical tools. When your theories are okay, then you spend your time doing data. And that is just a focus of part-time 
time that you spend currently doing one activity, but the overall goal is the same, which is to look for insight. Now, sure. you say we're going to, towards a data-driven, and I think that that is true. At the moment, the pain points are in data, but the next faster, well, the replacement for the, the next cars, the sort of not faster mm -hmm. horses, is actually a better understanding of computation. We're still stuck in a model of computation, which is uh, von Neumann and the, the whole of Turing paradigm, which we have done very little research on, and we're very happy because all of a sudden we have a map-reduced model, which is just two functional, depend two, two functional ways of looking that we know scale better than the others. And do, are you aware then of anyone actually doing research in those fields? Or is that something that should be kick-started from you? Because I think that that's where the next boundary is. Again. Well, so yes, there, I think there are lots of activities going on. So, so in Berkeley there is the, um, what is it called, the AMP Center, where they, where they are really exploring kind of both architecture and algorithms issues about a lot of the data driven computation. I think they are doing fantastic work. Then again, within Google, they are actually past, way past the MapReduce paradigm at this point. So that was what they did five, six years ago. So they are doing different things. And altogether, I think the exascale machines will force us again to rethink how we do high performance computing entirely because every, nothing that we do today will scale to exascale. So, so, so I think uh, you are right, we will have to change. It will have to be much more power efficient. We have to get on a completely different curve. So that's, that's non-incremental right away. So, so we will, otherwise we get stuck. So. A a any other questions? There's one right at the back. <laughs> that's okay. Sorry about the race. And I think we could take one more after that, if, if there is one. Um, great talk, Alex, as always. Um, just wondering what your comments were. A lot of the buzz in big data is around unstructured data, no SQL. Um, most of your work seems to be around structuring the data to make it usable and useful. So I was wondering what your comments were on some of the current trends and fashions. Um, in the industry. Yeah. So, so I tried to emphasize in the beginning that there are two kinds of big data searches or, or in science data-driven approaches. One is the exploratory and the other is confirmatory. So for exploratory, it's okay to use unstructured data and noisy data. Once you actually want to have a confirmation of a hypothesis, you want very controlled conditions and very well understood systematics and so on. So, so there it is clear that we will, for the confirmatory analysis, we will always have to do basically very structured things. For the exploratory, you know, it's free for all. So th there we can kind of take, because all that it gives us a hint and enables us to design a, a, the next experiment, which confirms or, or uh, kind of the hypothesis, so. Okay, well, let's uh, thank Alex again. <laughs> Before I, I let you go for uh, coffee, there's one sort of announcement I, uh, I have to make, which is the Jim Gray Award uh, for 2013, uh, which we normally make at this conference, well, um, uh, the recipient was unable to travel. So let me just remind you about the Jim Gray Award. Uh, it's awarded to a researcher who's made an outstanding contribution. Is, is this microphone on here? Shall I use this one? Yeah, I'll use that one. It's for a researcher who's made an outstanding contribution to the field of data intensive computing, uh, an innovator whose work truly makes science easier for scientists, a groundbreaking contributor to the field of e-science, and one who pursues an open, supporting, collaborative research model. And uh, uh, Kathleen Van Ingen, who used to be in Jim Gray's research group, uh, liked to quote, Jim preferred doers over talkers. And you've just seen an example uh, uh, here in, in Alex Saleh, who is absolutely a, a doer rather than just a talker, but he does give a good talk as well. So thanks, Alex. Uh, so these are our previous Jim Gray Award winners. So uh, uh, Alex, 
Carol Goble, Jeff Dozier, Anthony Williams last year, uh, and, and uh, the, 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 the oceanographer and uh, protein data bank uh, who are absolutely doers rather than just um, thinkers. So uh, I think this is important. And if you read the fourth paradigm, you'll find there are sections on environment where there's uh, articles by uh, some of these people. All right, and if you'll see in environmental science and in health and medical science and in also in infrastructure. But there's a fourth section, and the fourth section is about openness, open access, and, and the open access revolution to both publications and data. So this year, it's extremely valuable uh, and important that we are able to uh, award the 2013 Jim Gray Award to David Lipman, who, as you heard from Alex, was collaborating from the very beginning with people like Paul Ginsparg, with people uh, like Alex, uh, and with Jim Gray. And he and his staff at the NIH NCBI have had a huge impact because they've actually brought a huge amount of literature in PubMed Central to be open access. This is full text of papers. It's now by law that you have to deposit your papers in PubMed Central. And uh, previously, when it was only voluntary, there was 20% compliance. When George Bush signed it into law, it became 70%. And this year, the National Institutes of Health have said, if you don't put your paper in, we'll delay your next grant. And so they now have over 90% compliance. But that's not all that David did. Uh, he and his team created uh, not only the, the publications, but you can go from the publications to the databases. You can search across different databases. So it's a wonderful example of open science and what we need to do. This is for the biomedical field. We need to do that for other fields. So Jim Gray worked with David Lippmann. They worked on making a portable version of PubMed Central. That's why there's PubMed Central Europe, for example, and PubMed Central Canada. And so it's very appropriate that David Lippmann is this year's award winner, and I'll be going to uh, Washington, D.C. next week to uh, NCBI to present it to David. But can we just have a, a formal round of applause for this year's Jim Gray Award winner? Thank you very much. I think it's time for coffee. Thank you.